All right, how's everybody doing out there? Uh, I'm Thomas and welcome to my channel. I do educational videos. We are uh, right in the middle of going over the uh, reciprocal system of theory of Dewey B. Larson. This, I believe, is the 37th video on that subject. And in particular, we're looking at the 15th video on his final book called Beyond Space and Time. Larson's reciprocal system of theory was developed uh, throughout the 20th century, starting in about 1930 until his death in 1990, and then um, continuing on by others who have um, kind of uh, tried to uh, correct uh, certain aspects of the theory and uh, move it forward uh, up until the present day. Now, um, the basics of the theory is uh, it, Larson worked on the theory for 20 years or more before developing his basic postulates of the theory. And um, the basic postulates uh, really started with um, uh, the two uh, the two major postulates, and then once he he got those postulates, he developed uh, the theory based on uh, deductive reasoning, uh, just if this then that, if this then that, and uh, the major postulate is that the physical universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. Okay, so the universe is not made out of matter, not made out of energy, but it is made out of motion. And motion is the relationship between space and time. Both the space and time are the same. Uh, they're the same as each other, except they are, are reciprocals in motion. Uh, any type of scientific phenomena is a kind of motion and it is expressible specifically uh, in t exclusively in terms of space and time uh, for example speed uh, a car the bike is moving at 25 miles per hour 25 miles of space in one hour of time uh, the reverse the inverse of that is time over space as opposed to space over time time over space is energy it took me 30 seconds to move that thing 20 feet 30 seconds of time uh, per one unit of space uh, uh, one unit or I think it was 20 20 feet of space um, now time and space both have more than one dimension motion has uh, three dimensions so the numerator and the denominator in the time and space uh, fraction there, the ratio or relationship, uh, can be uh, more than one. Um, you know, it could be time squared, space squared, time to the third power, space to the third power, or even more uh, in certain situations such as density. Uh, for example, like um, uh, matter is time to the third power over space to the third power. But then in order to get density, density is mass over volume. And uh, volume is space to the third power. So uh, density is actually time to the third power over space to the sixth power. So that's kind of how that system works. Now, uh, Larson used uh, this basic postulate and uh, the other one, which is... Um, much uh, more problematic uh, even, but uh, the physical universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative math mathematics. Its magnitudes are absolute and its geometry is Euclidean. Uh, that's, that's just basic science. You know, anybody who is really practicing science is uh, in agreement with that, uh, except for the possible possibilities of the Euclidean geometry, and uh, that is uh, some of Larson's um, successors have taken him to task about that um, and have proposed projective geometry instead of Euclidean geometry. 
Euclidean geometry being just a subset of projective geometry. So they haven't like, you know, uh, completely reversed Larson's theory. They've just generalized it a little bit, a lot. Um, but anyway, um, uh, he ended up writing books on physics and astrophysics and chemistry, astronomy, um, and, uh, you know, all kinds of other stuff. He predicted the existence of quasars before they were even discovered back in the early 60s and, um, you know, uh, wrote many, many other books on kind of philosophy of science. And but eventually came to this his final book, which actually came out after he died. Uh, the book came out in 1995 called Beyond Space and Time. This is his foray into metaphysics, uh, into the uh, softer sciences like religion, philosophy, and um, and um, uh, a little bit of biology um, and psychology. And um, we are looking at chapter nine of this book, um, or we're actually wrapping up chapter eight of this book. And um, so uh, the basic gist of uh, this is comes th through basically extrapolation. So if the universe is made out of motion, uh, like whereas in Einstein's uh, formulation, motion, the speed of light is the maximum speed of the universe. For Larson, the speed of light is the midpoint or the neutral point of the universe. And there's a half of the universe that moves slower than light and a half of the universe that moves faster than light. Um, these are called the material sector, which we are familiar with, the slower than light speed uh, sector, and then the cosmic sector, uh, and that is faster than light. Uh, then he determines that uh, really the life unit, what is really called life, because this is just inanimate matter, and this is inanimate something or another. Um, and but but life comes by combining the two. Um, so where the chemical matter, the inanimate matter, comes under the control of the metaphysical or the cosmic unit. And so that is where life comes from. That's uh, what he calls uh, level two. And then level three is this ethical, uh, ethical man. Um, life doesn't come around until this um, sector one element, until this um, material body, inanimate body gets to its most complex which is DNA. A DNA molecule has like 10 billion uh, atoms in it. And once it gets to that level of complexity, then it can be taken over by this cosmic unit. And then um, that's sector two, the life unit. And then once the life unit becomes at its most complex, uh, which she says is humans or intelligent beings, then it also can come under the control of a sector three unit, which I think is just like the speed of light aspect. Uh, and um, under the control of that, uh, what he calls the general metaphysical region, then uh, it develops ethics. Okay, so this is kind of explaining, uh, beginning to set the stage for explaining things such as religion and you know, ethics. And um, in this chapter, he's getting into talking about ESP telepathy and uh, things like that. So um, I'm going to just start reading uh, from chapter eight at the end. Uh, he gives a little summary and then we'll get into a little bit of chapter nine, I believe. Um, Okay, in chapter 7, we applied our new knowledge of the physical universe to a study of the interaction of the universe with existence independent of it. And we were led to the theoretical conclusion that the most advanced living organisms, members of the human race, are under the partial or complete control of intelligent units from sector 3, the sector of the universe outside space and time. 
Then, when we turned to the information that has been gathered by observation and experiment, we found the situation just as predicted by theory. The behavior of human beings is incompatible in many respects with the behavior of other living organisms and with the basic principles that govern purely biological entities. It is therefore evident that at least some human beings are subject to a different type of control, one which follows a different set of basic principles, just as the theoretical study indicates. In this present chapter, we further deduced that the sector three units, which are combined with the human biological organisms and exercise control over them, should theoretically be able to communicate with each other through channels independent of space and time. Now we find that there is evidence from observation and experiment which indicates that human beings are able, under appropriate circumstances, to communicate with each other independently of space and time by a process known as telepathy. The observed facts are thus in agreement with the theoretical conclusions derived by extension of the reciprocal system of theory into the metaphysical region. Okay, now, so that's kind of a summary of uh, where he got with chapter eight, which was called communication local. Now we're moving into chapter nine, which is called communication general. And he'll give a little bit of a summary here uh, as the intro to the chapter. In the preceding pages, we established theoretically and confirmed by observational information that the control units which exercise full or partial direction of the action of human beings, the actions of human beings are intelligent and that they are able to communicate directly with each other, utilizing channels independent of space and time. Since the control unit is a local manifestation of existence in sector three, the general metaphysical region, it follows that all existences in sector three, or at least all existences of the same type are intelligent. We may therefore uh, further deduce that the observed ability of the intelligent sector three units which exist within the space-time universe to communicate with each other through their own channels indicates that sector three existences can communicate with each other by similar means wherever they are located. Communication between the control units and the sector three existences outside space and time is therefore theoretically possible. The present chapter will begin an exploration of the available information bearing on this point. If information about entities or events within the physical universe or elsewhere is available to the external sector three existences and is transmitted by them to the control units, the human individuals under the direction of these control units will acquire the information in a matter not capable of physical expl explanation. An observed phenomenon of this kind is one known as clairvoyance, one of the group of ESP phenomena. Like telepathy, it has been extensively investigated in recent years, and the conclusion, conclusions reached in the preceding chapter with respect to the validity of the results obtained in observations and experiments on telepathy are equally applicable to clairvoyance. The difference between the two phenomena is that in telepathy, both the transmitter and the receiver are human individuals, whereas in clairvoyance, only one human being, the receiver, is involved. The concept of perceiving facts and events without the aid of physical mechanisms and independently of space and time is a rather difficult one for a person who exists in space and time and whose normal activities are limited to the utilization of physical means. Some discussion of the basic situation is therefore in order. According to the findings of the reciprocal system of theory, the physical universe is composed entirely of units of motion, combinations of which constitute the various physical entities. 
in the material sector of this universe where life human life is located there is a continuous uniform progression of time current physical theory regards this time as one dimensional but the new theoretical development shows that it is actually scalar that is it has magnitude only without direction during this progression of time change of position due to motion takes place in three dimensions of space an intelligent human individual can become aware of events anywhere in the three dimensions of space subject to one the physical limitations of the available communication means and two the unidirectional nature of the time progression which limits the transmitted information to past events as stated earlier one of the most significant results of the devel development of this new and more accurate physical theory is the discovery that the material sector of the universe which has heretofore been believed to constitute the whole of the physical universe is actually only half of the total there is another half the cosmic sector as we are calling it which is identical with the material sector in every respect except that space and time are interchanged in this cosmic sector there is a continuous uniform scalar progression of space during this spatial you know in the same way that there was this uniform scalar progression of time in the material sector during this spatial progression changes of position due to motion take place in three dimensions of time here an intelligent existence can become aware of events anywhere in the three dimensions of time subject to the same limitations that apply in the material sector except that instead of being limited to events in in past time that is events that have been passed in the time progression the transmitted information in the cosmic sector is limited to events at locations that have been passed in the space progression inasmuch as we have found that the limitations applicable to the physical universe do not apply to the general metaphysical region it follows that an intelligent sector three existence can become aware of events anywhere in space or anywhere in time with equal clarity everywhere furthermore the limitation of the speed of transmission that applies to the general uh, to the physical universe is likewise inapplicable to sector three where space and time do not exist and speed the ratio of space to time therefore has no meaning we can also deduce that the sector three existences are aware of whatever exists in the general metaphysical re region itself all of the information at their command is then available for transmission to qualified human receivers one of the transmission processes is clairvoyance the sector three aspects of the human personality the control units are of the same nature as the sector three existences in the general metaphysical region and consequently there is a possibility that the human control units may be able to perceive these facts directly without having to depend on transmission of the information from sector three however our analysis of the third level of human life indicates that the control units as they exist in the present stage of development of the human race are relatively primitive occupying a position in their field comparable to that of a single-celled organism in the biological field it therefore appears more likely that clairvoyance is a manifestation of the intersector communication that we have found theoretically possible 
This conclusion is supported by the fact that some of the related phenomena that will be discussed later clearly belong in the communication category. The, uh, okay, so now that is, uh, that's where Larson is, uh, shines, is when he explains his theory uh, very clearly without any type of ref reference to other, other authors where he's just laying it, laying it down. And I would recommend that if you are a, a budding student of the reciprocal system of theory, that you go back and listen to what I just said, uh, reading his, his, uh, the intro to chapter nine there. Um, listen to it over and over again, and you eventually like understand how this reciprocal system works because uh, he just lays it down, a very good explanation and a summary of what's going on here uh, with the reciprocal system, sector one, sector two, sector three, and what they all mean and how they fit together. Not only that, but also the way he thinks about it, how he processes the information, and then how you also can fit into it. Now, after this, he gets, he starts getting into his long, um, you know, uh, literature review. Uh, all the, uh, Everybody else, all the philosophers and everything, all their opinions about it, about ESP and about clairvoyance, and it dilutes his whole presentation. So just stick with what I, what I just read from him. If you listen to that a couple times, I think you might really um, start to grasp the reciprocal system. Okay, uh, we're going to move on uh, tomorrow and uh, have a great day.